Okay, today we're going to have a go at making a kind of sharing feast bread, which is going to be flavoured with onions, tomatoes, scotch bonnet peppers and garlic. So this is going to be a hopefully really simple foolproof bread recipe. We're not actually using any kind of special flour here. We're using plain flour or you might know this as all purpose flour. You can use bread flour for this, a strong flour, but you don't need to. For a simple recipe like this, that's probably going to be eaten the same day it's baked, plain flour is just absolutely fine. So I'm going to be working in cups just to try to make this recipe accessible for people who might not have scales, but I will weigh the ingredients as I add them in. So if you need to work by weight, you can do that as well. So we're going to start off with two and a half cups of plain flour. So that's two cups and then half a cup. Now. The actual precision of these ingredients is not too critical because if the dough is not coming together you can just add a bit more water. If it looks a little bit on the wet side you can just add a bit more flour. It's very forgiving so don't worry too much about the precision of the ingredients. It's not that critical. So there's my half cup. So two and a half cups of flour for me comes out to 348 grams. So 350 grams of plain flour. So next we're going to put in the, the other dry ingredient which is Fast action bread yeast. I'm using this because it's very convenient. So we just put this straight into the flour and the dry ingredients and mix it in. And we don't even need to prime it or anything like that. If you've got a different kind of yeast, you may need to make it up with a bit of sugar and water first and let it foam. Just follow the instructions that come with the yeast that you've got. So we're gonna have, well, let's see, what, see what's in there. I think there's six gram sachets. We'll have a look. Seven grams. We've also got one tablespoon of white sugar. That's just going to help the yeast to get a good start. So that goes in. That's 18 grams of white sugar. And we've got a teaspoonful of salt, which is four grams. So now we're just going to mix those dry ingredients together. Kind of important to do that just so that the salt isn't all in one place. Okay, and then I've got a tablespoon of vegetable oil. You could use olive oil. I'm using sunflower because that's what I just happen to have. So let's weigh that in. So the oil, 18 grams of oil if you want to go by weight. And we're just going to mix that in as well. Obviously that's not a dry ingredient, but we're just going to mix it through and it will form little clumps, but they'll be fairly uniformly distributed. Okay, time for the wet ingredient now, which is water. I guess we could probably have that debate about whether water is wet. So anyway, so we want one cup of lukewarm water. This water is just off cold. It's, if it's freezing cold, it'll slow down your yeast. If it's boiling hot, it will kill your yeast. So the point is here not to have it too hot. We've got kind of lukewarm water, just one cup, which is, well, 200 mil or 200 grams, because it's water. We'll just make a, a little well in the middle of the flour. Not really necessary, but I just don't want it to go straight to the edges. All of the water straight in there, and then we're just gonna mix all of those ingredients together carefully making sure that we bring the flour off the edges of the bowl into the middle to mix it in with the with the dough. And just keep on mixing until that comes together into sort of one clump of dough, which it has done rather nicely. If there's a little bit of dry flour at the bottom of the bowl, don't worry about that. We will incorporate that in just a moment. Okay, time for a little bit of kneading. So we'll just sprinkle a little bit of extra flour on the board and on our hands just to make them not completely sticky. And then we'll turn out the dough and those extra little bits. Don't wash up the bowl yet because it's going to go back in there in a minute. So with clean hands, if your hands aren't clean at the start of this process, they will be at the end. We're just going to start to work this dough and just knead it like this. And it's just a case of push it down with the heel of your hand, fold a bit over, and keep on going like that. And as we do that, we're gonna try and incorporate in these little dry crumbs, which were there in the bottom of the bowl. 
And so the texture we're looking for in this dough is kind of pliable, but not too sticky. So if it feels a bit too sticky, just sprinkle a bit more flour on there and work with it and just keep on doing that really until you end up with a dough that you can handle like this that doesn't actually stick to the board or to your hands. We don't need a huge amount of kneading. So actually I've kneaded it there for about a minute and a half. That is enough kneading. With a bread dough, you might want to knead it for longer to work the gluten and to develop it. With this kind of flour, that's probably about as far as it's going to develop. So that now just goes back into the bowl and we cover that up. So any kind of bowl with a cover, you could put a cloth over it, just put a board on top or whatever, just to cover it up. And we're going to leave that for an hour until that dough ball has doubled in size. So we'll just have a quick tidy up now and we'll start preparing the filling. We're going to peel these tomatoes, so I've immersed them in boiling water and I'm going to leave them like that for a couple of minutes and the skins will loosen and come straight off. Not strictly necessary to do that, but it's about aesthetics really. Some people don't like the bitterness or the toughness of tomato skin when it's cooked, so we're just going to take it off anyway. Okay, let's get on with the rest of the ingredients. So I've got a large onion, so I'm going to dice that first. So we've just kind of coarsely diced the onion here. It doesn't really need to be too precise because the whole feel of this bread is going to be quite rustic. I'm just going to put that in the frying pan and then we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Next, I've got two Scotch bonnet chilies. Now, you could leave these out. You could use red pepper if you want. In fact, we will put some bell pepper in there as well, I think. So if you want a bit less of the spice level, substitute something else. In fact, any of these ingredients really substitute something you like if you don't like one of these things so if you don't like tomatoes put something else in you know if you don't like hot peppers substitute with something you do like I'm leaving the seeds in because I like the extra heat again if, if you want moderate heat you could use different chilies or you could de-seed them and they'll be a little bit less piquant we'll just mince that up like that that's going to go in the frying pan and then the ingredient that I actually completely forgot to announce at the start of the video is going to be red pepper and I'm going to put in a whole red bell pepper. Now I will get rid of the seeds on these because they tend to be just a little bit gritty even though they technically are the same thing as the seeds in chilies. I think they're just a bit larger and a bit more woody. And again, we're just going to chop these into rough dice. It doesn't have to be very pretty. And then the garlic. If you don't like chunks of garlic, you could crush it with a garlic crusher. I don't mind pieces of it, actually, so... I'm just going to chop it up small. So that's the pan I've been talking about. There's just a little bit of oil in the bottom of there. And then the onions, the pepper and the hot pepper. And we'll also have the garlic in there at the same time. And I'm just going to cook that over a gentle heat because I want these vegetables to soften down but not crisp up. That's one of the reasons I've got it in a small pan like this. It will be easier to control this and get this down to a kind of soft consistency than it would if I was in a bigger pan. Just because the moisture of all of these things will stay close together. Okay, and while that's cooking over a gentle heat, we're just going to go and prepare the tomatoes and one other ingredient. So these tomatoes have had five minutes in the boiling water. Let's take a look and see what they're like. And we should find that with the point of a knife, yeah, the skins just slip off them like that. Now these tomatoes are a little bit on the pale side, so I may add a little bit of tomato puree. And I'm just going to chop that down to small dice, well, rough small dice again. But I'm not going to put that in the pan just yet. And then the last ingredient is some thyme. I've got some thyme from the garden here, which I'm just going to strip off the leafy bits and lose the stalks. I'm using fresh thyme. There's no reason why you couldn't use dried thyme if you like, or use a mixed herb, dried herb mix like that. And then I'll give that a chop through, which will help to release some of the flavours. Of course, tomatoes and basil is the normal combination of herbs and fruit, but 
tomatoes and thyme will be really good. Right, so that's cooking down nicely, and I am going to add in a squirt of tomato puree because my tomatoes are quite pale. It's winter, so I'm adding that in now so it has a chance to fry off and cook properly with these onions and peppers and other things. Now, other things you could put in here if you wanted to, you could put some smoked paprika in there, that would be great. I'm not going to do that today because we're going to try and keep this nice and simple. And now that the onions have gone translucent and cooked down a little bit, we're not looking to crisp this up at all. We're going to go in with the tomatoes and thyme. And immediately this will start to stew a little bit, but that's fine because we are making essentially a kind of chunky sauce here. I'm going to leave that to cook for five to ten minutes. And that's more or less where I wanted to get to with this. The vegetables are all cooked down nice and soft now. There's no visible liquid in the bottom of the pan, but it's not completely dried out and it's not started to really go crispy. So that's where I wanted to get to. I'm going to turn off the heat now because we've got to let that cool. I'm going to let that cool down to room temperature because we also need to wait for the bread. The bread dough is starting to rise. We can see that that's expanded already. It's probably only about one and a half times its original volume at the moment. We want that to be double the original size before we can do anything else. So that's fine because we've got to wait for the vegetables to cool down. So we'll have a tidy up. Nice cup of tea. We'll come back in a minute. Okie dokie. Right, so the filling has cooled down to room temperature and it's looking nice and firm. There's no free liquid in there. That's good. That's what we want. And the bread dough. Take a look at this. More than doubled in size. Now for this recipe, we're only gonna knock back this dough once. So we knead it now, we prepare the thing, and then we let it prove again and then bake it. With a regular loaf of bread, you might knock it back once, let it prove again, knock it back a second time, and then put it in the tin, and then prove it and bake it. This one only gets knocked back once, which is what we're about to do now. First thing, we're gonna get an oven proof tray, tiny little bit of oil on it, just to stop this sticking and we'll just spread that over the bottom of the tray. And then we'll have this bread dough out of here and we're gonna knead it again on the board. And you can see as soon as I touch that, that's deflated again, but that's fine, that's perfectly normal. So just with a little bit of flour to stop it from sticking, we're just gonna knead that again just a few times, it really doesn't need much. We need to roll this out into a flat sheet of dough. And that's gonna be a little bit difficult because it kinda of wants to spring back, you can see. Because the gluten has worked in the flour, it, when you stretch it, it wants to come back. I'm gonna use a rolling pin. If you haven't got a rolling pin, you could use any straight-sided bottle with the label taken off. And just to make this easier to manage, I'm gonna work with half of the dough So that we don't run out of space. And flour it up and you can work this flat with your hands. You can do the kind of pizza dough method where you just do this sort of thing repeatedly until you end up with a, a flat piece of dough but I'm going to use a rolling pin because it's an easier way to get a more uniform dough. It's really quite stretchy and it really wants to go back into its shape. So we have to kind of work with it a bit here, but that's starting to look okay. You can see how it's springing back. And, and this is just a regular plain flour dough as well. If I'd done this with bread flour, we would be finding this was even more stretchy than this. But there we go, we've got it to about half a centimetre thick, I think, probably. Doesn't really matter if the shape is a bit irregular it's going to be fine. Now I'm going to spread, well hopefully about half of my filling onto this sheet of dough. That's about half I'd say. Maybe like that. Okay, just spread that out fairly evenly. And then we're just going to roll it up like this. This is going to be a bit messy probably, but let's see how far we get. So just going to pick up the edge and roll it, bring in those bits there so we can 
get a little bit of a seal on there and roll it around to try to enclose all of that filling. Some of it's going to spill out, make a bit of a mess, don't worry. So I'm going to cut this into, I think, probably six pieces. So we'll cut it in half and then cut each of these into three. Okay. And then the bit that does require a little bit of care, we'll take these and stand them up here on the tray. And I'm just going to start in the middle, kind of work my way around, and hopefully we'll end up with something that looks like we did it on purpose. Okay, that's good. Now I need to do the same with the other piece of bread. And again, it's fighting me. The dough is fighting and springing back, but that's fine. We'll just, we'll just roll with it. Just stretch it and hold it for a bit, and that will hopefully keep it in that size and shape. Right. On with the second half of the filling and spread that out. Just keep it away from that edge, the far edge, because we do need to kind of seal it over there when we roll it around. But this recipe is very forgiving of method and accuracy and precision. It's going to be, I keep on using the word rustic, but that's actually pretty much an accurate term for what this is going to be. So we just roll that over like that. We are squeezing out the filling as we go a bit, so just with my fingers, just pushing it back in underneath. Roll it out into a spicy Swiss roll. And again, cut into six pieces. These six pieces are gonna get arranged somehow around the edge here, kind of thing. Yeah, that'll do. Now, we need to leave that to prove for half an hour or so, just until we see all of this bread dough puff up again. So I'm gonna use that time to preheat my oven. Depending on how warm your climate is and how warm your house is, this will happen faster or slower. For me, this is probably gonna be about half an hour, but if you're in a warmer place, you're gonna find this proves really quickly. So this is the chance to get the oven ready. When this is doubled in size and puffed up and we'll see it all kind of bond together, then we'll be ready to bake. So to keep any flies or anything like that off of it, and just to keep it from drying out completely, I'm just going to cover loosely with a bit of foil, and then we'll leave that to prove. This has been proving for about half an hour now. This is not really a time thing, this is more of an appearance sort of thing. So you have to kind of look at it and judge it, and figure out, has that kind of doubled in size? I think it has. I'll put it alongside the original picture, so unproved on the left, proved on the right. You can get an idea for how much that's supposed to change and the second proving here before baking. So that's going to go into the oven for a total baking time of probably 35 minutes, but we'll check it after 20. So while we're waiting for that to bake, just a couple of things. I am aware that my oven sounds like a scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark. But also, why am I doing this recipe and what's this all about? Well, my friend Babatunde in Nigeria has just got himself a charcoal oven and wants to try it out. And we're trying to think up a kind of forgiving recipe because it's a charcoal oven. It's basically a metal box with a tray of charcoal in the bottom. And so we're going to have to find something, you know, a little bit forgiving of temperature and time and ingredients and so on. So I thought this would be a good recipe to try out. and. Really just to, if we don't know the exact temperature of the oven, it's going to work okay. So anyway, there's a link in the video description and in this card, if you're on a card enabled platform, please do go off and check Baba Tunde's recipe and please be kind and constructive with your comments and feedback to Baba Tunde on his video. I'm looking forward to seeing it myself. And to serve with my bread, I'm just going to make a quick soup out of these vegetables. So I've got celery and onion, I'm just going to fry those first with the carrot diced up small. Then I'm gonna add sweet potato and regular potatoes and some stock. Simmer that until everything's soft and then blend it to a nice smooth soup. I'm not gonna show you all of the cooking process for that because it's just really simple.
Now you might just look at that and think, oh, that looks like really bland baby food. I can tell from the aroma that's not gonna be bland. That's got all of those vegetables in there, loads of flavor. But also don't forget, we're gonna be serving this with that really spicy, chunky, textural bread with all of those bits of onion and pepper and everything in it. So this soup is really just the foil to the star of the show, which is the bread. So we're only about halfway through the baking now, but you can already see how much that's risen and puffed up in the oven. It's not gonna get any bigger than that, because obviously the yeast is starting to die off now with the temperature. Now it will bake and hopefully stay that size, nice and light and risen when it comes out. Okay, now I said this was gonna take 35 minutes, but I think it's gonna be nearer 25. I'm just gonna turn it around quickly, halfway, so that we can make sure it cooks evenly. Right, that's been a total of 30 minutes. Let's see what we got. And I would say that's about as done as I want, really. We could bake that a little bit longer and get some more color in here, but we'd be at risk of burning the edges. Okay, so just gonna put that there to cool down now for five to 10 minutes. I'm not gonna to attempt to move it while it's hot because it will probably just break apart. So we'll let that cool down a bit before we try to handle it. Right, so, nice bit of this sweet potato soup. And the idea with this bread is you just tear off a piece and help yourself. So it's ideal for sharing. Ironically, I'm the only one in the house who really likes this much spice. So I'm kind of sharing it with myself, but let's have a taste anyway. Mm. It's just absolutely crammed with flavor. The onions, the peppers, the tomato, the scotch bonnet, chilies, just really lovely. And with this mild tasting sweet potato soup, that is a really nice combination. So if we just take a close look at this bread, you can see it's still a little bit doughy on the inside, but it's wonderfully soft and luscious and so tasty. So that was my spicy spiral sharing bread. I hope you found that interesting. Don't forget to support Babatunde by visiting his video where he's gonna to try to make this in his new charcoal oven. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.